Hello and welcome to another module of the Design Patterns Training for Embedded C Programming. My name is Martin Schroeder at SwedishEmbedded.com and um, I'm putting out these modules every month so uh, subscribe to my channel if you don't want to miss the next module or if you want to get all of the modules of this Design Patterns course you can get it as a book which is available on Amazon. Uh, there is also a Udemy course with video content available on Udemy and um, on my website you can get a subscription as a student where you get Get also access to live Q&A every Wednesday at 19.00 Central European time where you can ask me questions live, we can have a discussion, we can look at particular problems you're facing in your development and that is available through my website. So if the links don't work for you, uh, go to Amazon, search for Embedded C Programming Design Patterns, that's the title of the book. On Udemy you have uh, the video content and with each module you also have a resources section where the book content is available as a PDF and on the website everything is available as part of the website course. So if you go to the website, click join now, uh, enter your details, choose student and click continue. Then once you're registered, you will be able to access the training through the training section here. And you're also going to have access to all the other trainings that are available on the website when you become a member there. So uh, let's jump right into it and uh, look at the opaque pattern. Now, uh, opaque pattern is very similar to the object pattern, but the only difference is that we are hiding the definition of the object itself. And with this, we are also moving the responsibility of, of allocating the object from the caller to the implementation itself. So the object becomes completely hidden and we can uh, have full freedom with the implementation without having to include the dependencies of the implementation into the code that is using our object. The defining characteristics of the opaque pattern is that it's basically a pattern where we define the data structure itself in the implementation C file. So if you remember the object pattern, we were defining a data structure, but it was placed in the header file where it's visible to everybody who is using that object. And there was a, a point with that because it's the only way that we can allocate that object um, elsewhere outside of the implementation. But if we want to make this object private, we need to make it opaque. Um, and we need to make it private basically by including it into the implementation itself. So here we're just declaring the data type in the header file, but we're placing the actual definition of the data type in the C file. And the biggest, the biggest consequence of that is that um, the implementation is now responsible for allocating that object because the caller cannot allocate the object because he doesn't know the size of the object. He doesn't know the definition of the structure. So we need to move the allocation to the implementation. And that has its own problems, as we will see in this module. The next point is that implementation uses um, the object pattern internally. So this is basically like the object pattern, but we're just hiding the implementation. So you need to go through the full module on the object pattern to kind of get the general idea. And then after you've done that, you can watch this video uh, to see how we can uh, move the allocation into the implementation instead. And we are adding a new idiom, the new and delete, because we're going to be allocating the objects internally. So we, we're going to need to have a way of separating the allocation from initialization. And it's a good idea to separate it this way, as I'll explain a little bit later. And uh, when it comes to the user of, of the objects, the, the user will now only deal with pointers. So if you remember from the object pattern, we were allocating the data structure. So we would have basically a member in the application data structure that corresponds to our object we are trying to operate on. And when we were passing it as the self pointer to, uh, to the implementation functions, we were using the reference uh, the AND symbol, basically, to pass a pointer. But in this case, we are getting a pointer from the implementation, and that pointer already represents an allocated object, and so we are only dealing with pointers. So when we store this object, uh, we're going to be storing a pointer instead of storing the full data structure. There are two main use cases for the opaque pattern. And uh, number one is that we want to isolate the dependencies. We want to make sure that uh, the dependencies on which the header file depends or the, 
the data structure itself depends, that those dependencies are not visible to anybody who includes that header file. And number two, we want to prevent direct data access by the user. So we don't want any other code modifying the internal data structure because we want to have full control over when we access that data so that we can introduce uh, thread safety and uh, concurrent concurrency protection if needed. So let's have a look at the implementation. The general pattern is that uh, we define our structure itself as just a declaration in the header file. So in the header file, we don't define the full data structure. We just, uh, we just type struct opaque, and we can then use this data structure as pointers so that we can pass, pass it and declare those functions here, but we don't need to actually define what this structure looks like. And then in the private implementation, that's where we define the structure. So this structure becomes local to the C file. In comparison with the object pattern where we define the structure in the header file, here we define the structure in the C file instead. So the C file is the only file that actually knows about the size of the structure. And that's the main problem that we run into with opaque pattern is that we don't know the size, but there is ways around it, as I will show you soon. So in order to deal with this uh, size problem, uh, we need to define an allocation strategy. So we have three main strategies to choose from. One is stack allocation, where we have to use a special function called alloc a, which allocates uh, the data structure based on the size that we pass to that function. Because we cannot, remember, we cannot, uh, we cannot allocate the variable on the stack directly because we don't know its size when, when we use this header file since the structure is not defined there. So we need to use either stack allocation using alloc a, which is basically exactly the same as normal uh, variable allocation. It's just that we are using a dynamic size, which we, which we get from the implementation. We're going to implement a special function uh, that just returns the data structure size. Number two is we can use dynamic allocation, which is the most common method in C++ where you use new and delete. Um, and uh, that also allows us to allocate this uh, opaque data structure without actually knowing what's in it. But on embedded systems, we tend to try not to use malloc because, um, or at the very least, we don't use it uh, during runtime. We might use it only during initialization, but even that is preferably, preferably you shouldn't even do that. So uh, stack allocation is the main method. And then we also have static allocation, in which case we allocate the variable statically inside the, inside the C file. But on the other hand, we need to know exactly how many instances we're going to be using. This method works if we have some code generation alongside of our build process that can, for example, parse a device tree and, um, uh, and give us the data that we need um, to know how many instances we need to actually instantiate during compile time. And we'll look at an example of that as well. Zephyr uses this method and um, Zephyr uh, instantiates the device driver data structures in this way. So we can, we can make use of uh, generated code that is then included into our build process. And from that, we can, we can tell how many instances we need to instantiate. So let's have a look at the stack allocation method. This method uses the alloc a function, which actually define, uh, which actually allocates the structure on the stack. So we can use it like this. We basically need to define a size um, function, which we define exactly the same way as we define any function in the object pattern, but uh, we don't pass we don't pass the self pointer to it. And basically, this has the equivalent of being a static function if we were to use C++, for example. So this would be just a, uh, in C++, uh, when I say static, I mean in the, in the meaning of C++, um, that this function doesn't take a this pointer, basically. In C, we have slightly different meaning of static functions, um, because when we say static, we mean basically that it's only visible inside the C file. But anyway, so we define this function for the size, and this function just returns the size of the opaque, because we know the size of the opaque inside the implementation. We don't know it outside of the implementation, but we need to, we need to basically get it from the implementation. And then we use alloc a with this size, which we pass into it, and we get an object here, which basically then behaves just like the, any object using the object pattern. So we can just use it, we can initialize it, we can, 
uh, call functions that uh, that set any data in it. We can deinitialize it, but we cannot access the data directly. So we cannot write obj and then uh, arrow data because we don't know what is inside of this object. So this is very practical. And we um, and this is actually also checked by the compiler. So alloc a is actually a macro that translates um, into uh, into some code that basically um, uh, the end result is that the compiler can tell that this is a stack variable. So we cannot return this pointer. We're going to get an error if we try to return it from a function that that does this that does alloc a. Um, so in 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 the in practice, this is basically like allocating the uh, the structure directly on the stack. So if we were to just write struct opac obj and without the star here, um, and just semicolon at the end, uh, this is exactly the same. It has zero overhead. Now with the dynamic allocation, we can use malloc. We can we can allocate it on the heap, and we can return a pointer uh, that points to this newly allocated data structure, and then we can use this pointer exactly the same way. The drawback here is that we have to use the heap, and uh, if if you're using uh, if you're coding on an embedded system, sometimes you wouldn't even have malloc. It wouldn't even work. So you would just call it, and it will always return null because there is no heap. So you, you really have to uh, think twice before you start using uh, the heap allocation. And if you ever use it, uh, don't deallocate the objects because that's the main problem with the heap. If you allocate and deallocate uh, very often, you can end up with, with a heap that has a lot of fragmentation. So uh, you can end up with a failed allocation and just run out of memory during runtime. And that's the worst thing that can happen because then you have to restart the whole firmware and that could potentially lead to problems. So try not to use heap. Um, try to use the static allocation or uh, stack allocation. Uh, but this is uh, another method that uh, you can use to allocate one of these opaque objects. And lastly, let's look at this static allocation. This requires uh, support from your build system. So for example, in Zephyr, uh, all of the device drivers, they instantiate the device driver data structures uh, statically. Um, and this method has the big advantage that you know the size of your memory at compile time. So you can uh, inspect how much memory you're actually using before you even flash the firmware to the, to the actual board. But it does require a support from the build system. And in the case of Zephyr, we have um, uh, the Zephyr build system basically parses the device tree for the board that you're building for and uh, compiles it into preprocessor directives. So then we have some of this utility macros such as dt inst for each status OK that, um, that work with these um, pre-compiled preprocessor directives. And it can actually, uh, it, it actually expands to um, this macro here that we pass as a parameter. This macro is going to be called multiple times for every uh, device tree node that has status OK. So this is a very practical method, like if you have this infrastructure in place. So then we will just, uh, be, we will just be calling this, this macro and instantiating these data structures for every instance of the device tree node that we have in our device tree. So in this case, it would be PWM STM32 data one, or it's going to start at data zero, and then data one, data two, etc. And all of these variables are going to be instantiated for every device tree node. Now, this macro here, um, this macro will also uh, link this um, device data structure into a global list of devices. So the application can then query this particular instance using a device tree label, which is also very practical. But the biggest drawback, of course, here is that you do need to have support from the build system. So that's that's it. That's the three main methods. Um, and if you're using the static allocation, it's basically just, just like the object pattern. You just uh, allocate it on the stack, and then you can use it. The benefits, the main benefits of this pattern, basically it hides the implementation. So you have, you're not just hiding the, the code of the implementation, you're hiding the data structure itself. So that's the biggest benefit of this pattern and you limit the dependencies. So you don't need to um, include all of the dependencies um, that, the, that, that, that you need in order to define the data structure itself. You don't need to include them into every single source file that includes your header.
The two main drawbacks of this pattern is that uh, you do need to decide on allocation scheme, a little bit more complex because of that. And um, it prevents also structuring your data in, uh, in a single uh, data tree. So you cannot instantiate your objects directly under, for example, the application object. You do need to allocate them. You do need to either place them on the, on the heap um, in the global uh, memory location where you have all of the static variables, if you, do, if you use static allocation, or you need to place it on the stack. But ultimately, from your application structure, you would just have a pointer pointing to that memory location. So it can be a little bit um, problematic if you forget uh, to deallocate the memory or if you deallocate it using the wrong function. For example, you allocate it on the stack and then you call free, uh, which will try to basically free non-existent heap memory and things like that. So you do need to be a little bit more attentive when you use this pattern compared to the object pattern. For the best practices, uh, try to use the stack allocation as much as possible because it's hard to uh, it's hard to mess it up. Basically, it's it's exactly the same as a stack variable, so you don't need to even remember to delete it. But you do need to keep in mind that uh, if you allocate it on the stack, you shouldn't return from that function because or, and you shouldn't store any pointers to that data structure anywhere because it's going to become invalid. And if you do use uh, heap allocation, then uh, a good idea is to use new and delete as uh, separate functions so that it's clear that you're actually allocating something on the heap and, and not on the stack. And you can also check for the return value from malloc uh, and make sure that the allocation always succeeds. The main pitfall of this pattern, um, and actually the main pitfall of any pattern that allocates anything, is that you can uh, run out of memory. So if you are allocating a very large data structure, and this is also the same problem you're going to run into if you try to allocate that structure directly on the stack uh, as a variable, is that uh, you can uh, all of a sudden run out of stack. So you would just, uh, the allocation will succeed, but then when you try to write data into it, you're going to corrupt the stack and then your, your firmware will crash. But that's that's a problem that's that's hard to avoid either way. So it's not this, it's not a problem with this pattern per se. It's more of a problem uh, of large data structures. So if you have some very large data structures, you should either make them static or you should allocate them on the heap. Uh, or you should at least make sure that, that you have enough stack space to accommodate for these variables. And if you're using uh, malloc and free, then memory fragmentation is the, is the biggest pitfall because uh, you can uh, allocate and deallocate things very often and then all of a sudden you, you might get an allocation that fails and you need to obviously have a way of handling that. So that's one of the biggest reasons to avoid um, uh, heap allocation in memory constrained systems because then you don't need to deal with that. The main alternative to this pattern is the object pattern. So if, if there is no specific need to, uh, if there's no complex implementation behind, you can always make the object fully visible. And uh, it's a lot easier when you just have the object pattern to work with. Uh, the second alternative is a singleton pattern where you have one statically allocated instance. So you don't need to worry about the allocation scheme. You just allocate that instance internally. Um, and the third pattern is abstract API pattern, which is which is very much in line with how Zephyr uh, uses uh, this static allocation for the drivers. So you have your allocation um, happening automatically at compile time, and then the the interaction between your application and the objects happens through an abstract API. But you do need to have a way of querying uh, the object that you need. So basically, at, at startup, your application is going to just retrieve uh, the generic handles to the objects it wants to work with, and then call generic functions, which go through function pointers and, and actually translate into uh, concrete implementations. So that's a little bit more complex. And we'll cover this abstract API pattern in a different module in this training. Uh, but that's nonetheless another alternative to the opaque pattern. So we have covered the opaque pattern in this uh, in this module. Um, I've shown you a way of hiding uh, implementation of your object. I've shown you a way of um, three different ways, in fact, of allocating objects. Um, I've shown you um, how to declare those opaque handles. 
uh, how to deal with with the problem of not knowing the size of the of the data structure so by this uh, time you should be able to use this in your application and you should be able to work confidently with with this pattern and know when to use it and when you should maybe use something else let's do a little quiz so um, what are some of the reasons why we would want to hide the data structure in the first place Why does the opaque pattern require a custom allocation scheme? Why can't you just allocate this variable on the stack like you would do with an object pattern? How does using the opaque pattern affect the structure of the data of your application? For example, if you have your struct application that contains all of the data for the application, um, what would you be storing in that structure when you use the opaque pattern? Where, where would you be st storing the, uh, the internal data of the opaque object? Why is it that allocation um, must use, I, I wrote here must be private, but basically why, why, why does it need to use a size that uh, it needs to retrieve from the implementation? Why is it a good idea to automate the allocation of the objects at compile time? So for example, if we use a device tree as our basis, um, we make it data-driven. All right, that's it for this module and um, I'll see you in the next one.